All right, welcome everybody. There are enough familiar faces here that I'm not sure I need to do an extensive <laughs> introduction. Um, I'm John Haig and I'm the co-director of the Mosava Romani Center for Business and Government. It's great to see all of you here. For those of you that are online, it's great to um, see you online. I will try to remember to speak into the microphone so you can hear us. Um, we are extremely fortunate today. We have with us uh, Tim Massad. Um, and just a little bit of background about Tim. Um, he is currently a research fellow here in the Mosava Romani Center for Business and Government. He's also an adjunct professor uh, at the law school at Georgetown. Um, just a little bit of his background. He is the former chairman of the Commodities Futures Trading Commission. For those of you that don't know, um, CFTC is the, is the uh, regulatory body that basically uh, regulates derivatives and swaps. And so they were the first organization, the US organization to really focus on the question of cryptocurrencies um, and the question of how they should be regulated. So that was during the Obama administration. Um, he also, prior to that in the Obama administration, served as Assistant Secretary for Financial Stability of the U.S. Department of the Treasury. Um, and for those of you that don't know, that is the, in the function that oversaw TARP, the Troubled Af Asset Relief Program, after the uh, uh, financial crisis in 2008. So two massively huge, important jobs in the last uh, eight years of that time. Um, he... Before that, actually, which I didn't realize this until I started to look this up, he was a partner at the law firm of Cravath, Swain, and Moore. And for those of you that don't know law firms, that's one of the leading law firms in the world. Um, and he went to Harvard College, uh, and he went to Harvard Law School. And today, the topic is Bitcoin, stablecoins, and CBDCs, how U.S. policy is about to change. The timing is perfect because Biden issued the executive order this morning. Uh, and there's a lot of work going on with that. I will hand it over to Tim. Thank you for, okay. for coming. My pleasure. It's great to see all of you and hello to everyone who's online. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, kind of the digital asset space um, and in particular focus on policy because there's just been a lot of developments in the last few months, including even this morning with the issuance of the White House executive order uh, which refers to ensuring responsible innovation in digital assets. And um, I'm going to talk about it in, I like to kind of divide it these days into three buckets, if you will. Uh, Bitcoin and what I, you know, the rest of altcoins, altcoins are all other crypto uh, currencies that generally people would exclude stablecoins from that. Second category, stable coins. Third is CBDCs, except I'm going to do them in reverse order, and hopefully you'll see why. Um, so that's my agenda. So CBDCs first, and you know we often talk about those as 21st century public money. I'll get to what I mean by public versus private for those of you who, for whom that might be a new kind of distinction. Stable coins are often talked about as 21st century private money, and then with uh, Bitcoin and altcoins, it's more of a sort of a regulatory challenge of what kind of regulatory framework should we have. And then just to make it extra topical, I'll say just a few closing words on how uh, the terrible uh, events in the Ukraine may actually affect policy in this area. So let, let's start with what is money, because to the extent we're going to talk about something being public money or private money, we need to talk about what is money. These are properties that people often say are the characteristics of money, whether it's coin, paper money, electronic payments, um, a widely accepted means of payment, meaning you can use it to buy and sell goods and services, uh, a unit of account, meaning we can measure value by reference to it. That is worth $10. Um, and a store of value, meaning if I, if I put my value in money, it's not going to disappear as it might if I said, well, I own, you know, uh, a warehouse uh, or a silo full of grain, of wheat. Well, that's going to you know, decline in value. But uh, money would be a store of value. Finally, people often talk about NQA, no questions asked, meaning that money has to be something that nobody asks any questions about. Of course, I'll accept it. Of course, when you hand me dollars, I'll accept it. When you write me a check on a bank, at least a bank in the US, I'll accept it, right? So um, keeping that in mind, let's 
talk about CBDC, central bank digital currencies. Now, you might already kind of be thinking, well, wait a minute, central bank digital, so a digital currency, that sounds electronic. Don't I already have lots of means of electronic payment? Um, and of course you do. Um, you have PayPal, MasterCard, Visa, Apple Pay, Venmo, Cash App, all sorts of things, right? They're all very fast. And so why do we need some you know, new form of digital money? And um, the fact is that all of those run through our banking system. The only thing that's public money is that, right? Dollar bills, $10 bills, so on and so forth, at least for individuals. That is the only thing that um, we can hold that is a liability of the government. All those other things, visa cards, even the deposits in a bank, that's all private money, meaning it is an obligation, it is a liability of a private entity. Now, my deposit in Bank of America is insured up to the federal limit, but it's still an obligation of a private entity. It's not uh, the Federal Reserve. Now, of course, when I refer to the dollar bill as a liability of the Federal Reserve, if I walk in to the Federal Reserve and I present them with a dollar, what are they going to give me? They're going to give me a dollar. They're not going to, you know, they used to give you gold, but they don't do that anymore. Um, but that's kind of what we mean by public versus private money. And most of the money circulating in the system is private, right? The Fed prints money, um, but everything you do electronically as an individual is private money. Banks do have electronic liabilities of the Fed. They have reserve counts at the Fed. That is a form of uh, digital money, electronic money, um, uh, but only banks have that. Come on in. Um, so, um, and the thing about private money is while it may seem fast to all of us, right? You use your credit card, it goes through, it's, there's no delay. Our system is actually relatively slow and expensive compared to um, systems in other countries, as well as compared to what it could be, because it all runs through not just one bank, but many banks usually. There's multiple banks involved in clearing any payment. And these payment rails, and they're often referred to as payment rails, you know, were built over time. And truthfully, there hasn't been all that much innovation in a lot of it. So it's complicated. There's a lot of stuff that happens. You know, people refer to back office or things like that. There's just a lot of stuff that happens that most of us as individuals don't see. So our payment system in the US is bank dominated. It's largely funded by deposits. It's safe and it's well tested. And it, you know, generally works pretty smoothly, but it is relatively slow and expensive compared to what we call real-time payment systems in other countries. Um, and I think that's due basically to insufficient competition, which has resulted in insufficient innovation by our banks. Um, so what are the advantages of CBDCs? Well, first, of course, greater efficiency, um, lower cost. You know, we pay the, the percentage that we pay for payments, you know, is around 3%. It's pretty high. Merchants obviously have to make, you know, payments to Visa and MasterCard. Banks charge uh, uh, fees. Now, we may not see that directly, but it is rolled into prices. And so our, the, the fees for the U.S. payment system are, are higher than in uh, other countries that have modernized their systems <coughs> more than we have. Um, <clears throat> Cross-border payments in particular. If you've uh, had to do any cross-border payments, you may have found that, well, they were a little slow and costly. And particularly for people, the lower rungs of the income ladder who might be sending remittances home to families, immigrant workers, for example, it can be very expensive. They can be paying five to 10% of the value of the payment goes in fees. Um, 
a lot of people advocate for CBDCs because they say, well, cash is declining in use. In the US, it actually has not really been declining uh, that quickly. Now the pandemic has maybe changed that some, but um, CBDCs I think are important in that regard because we all kind of just want to use more electronic money. But, but most people who are in this space do not talk about this as replacing cash. There would still be cash. Um, another advantage is financial inclusion, meaning making financial services more accessible, um, um, particularly for people of lower means who are underserved. And I'll get to that in a little more detail in a moment. And then there's these kind of broader arguments. Well, you know, the whole economy is digitizing, so we need to do this. And from the standpoint of the role of the dollar internationally, it's very important today. It's the main means of payment, reserve currency of the world. Don't we need to do this? And those arguments I think are important. They're sometimes a little fuzzy in the, in the analysis. You can kind of press on that a little bit. Say, well, exactly how, or are there other ways we could, we could address those objectives, but those are there too. But let me spend a moment on financial inclusion. So, so how could a CBDC improve financial inclusion? Well, one way is certain uh, models of a CBDC actually call for uh, the Fed, the Federal Reserve to create retail accounts. All of us could have an account at the Fed. It would be very low cost. So that would be a way to address the fact that some people don't have bank accounts because they find them too expensive or they can't even get them. Um, simply speeding up payments helps um, lower income people in particular. Probably all of us in this room, if we go to deposit a check, we probably don't worry that much about how quickly it clears unless maybe it's a really big check. Uh, and maybe the bank credits it immediately. But if you live paycheck to paycheck, as a lot of people in this country do, um, you care a lot about that because if it takes three days for that check to clear uh, and your bills are due, you can't pay your bills and uh, you get hit with overdraft fees. Um, a lot of banks um, even have their business model largely based on over, overdraft fees, overdraft and non-sufficient funds fees were like $35 billion in revenue to banks um, in recent years. Um, so, you know, if you, if you live paycheck to paycheck, what do you do? You go to a check cashing place instead of your bank. Because when you go to a check cashing firm, you present your paycheck, they give you cash immediately, they take 10%, uh, but they might also uh, pay your bills for you. You say, well, I gotta pay my rent, I gotta pay my utilities and I gotta make my car payment. And they say, okay, you know, we'll do all that. And you're done and one stop shopping. And it's expensive, but it's fast. And you don't get hit, you know, paying 10% paying, um, sounds like a lot, but if you get, you know, hit by a $35 overdraft fee for every single transaction you do, that adds up very quickly. Um, and credit cards, as much as all of us love our cards, they're actually very regressive in terms of their impacts on, on the population. Meaning that, you know, probably for most of us in this room, we have one or maybe more credit cards. Um, that means we don't have to pay for 30 days, right? We get free revolving credit. Um, we might get cash back. We might get frequent flyer miles. We might get other benefits. And sure, you pay an annual fee, but you know, that's probably not that much. Um, people on the lower rungs of the income ladder in this country have much more trouble getting credit cards. They might use debit cards, but debit cards don't give you all those advantages typically. And yet they are paying the same fee, the same prices for goods that they buy as we are. So our cards, the cost of our cards is effectively subsidized by that. So, um, a lot of people would argue that, look, a CBDC can, can make financial services more accessible and um, uh, less costly, particularly for people of lower means. Um, the unbanked and the underbanked in this country, um, it's actually a little less than 25%, which fix that typo, but uh, almost 25% of the households in this country are unbanked or underbanked. It's a, it's a staggering number. It's a number we should be ashamed by. Um, 
Unbanked meaning nobody in the household has a bank account. Underbanked meaning they have a bank account, but they still use check cashing services, money orders, remittances, uh, other types of services, payday loans, even though those are very expensive because of the reasons I, I talked about before on slow clearing, or they may not trust the bank or the bank may charge them much higher fees than they charge us. Um, and so it's estimated that uh, that group spends about 10% of their income just to utilize their income. Use of check cashers illustrates the point. This is a survey um, by the Federal Reserve. Um, this shows you the use of check cashers by banking status. And um, you can see that banked population is actually very large, right? The unbanked is only about 5.4%. But if even uh, a small percentage of those people use check cashers, that's a lot of people. So 70% of the people that go and use check cashers actually have bank accounts. That's, I think, again, a, a statistic we should be you know, embarrassed by. Now, um, there's some other advantages potentially of CBDCs. Um, some people would say, well, this would facilitate monetary policy and fiscal policy. The Fed, if the Fed wanted to pump more money into the economy, all it has to do is credit all our accounts, boom, like that. Um, and if the Treasury, you know, if the Congress says we want to distribute pandemic benefits, same thing. We, we have accounts for every American, we just give them the benefits right away. Um, it's programmable. For something like that, for example, the Fed wants to stimulate the economy. We want to be sure you use that money now. We don't want you to save it. So we're going to program it. So if you don't spend it, it expires. Um, and some people would say, well, look, we got we to gotta develop a CBDC because otherwise we're going to have Bitcoin and we're going to have stable coins and we're going to have all these forms of private money and there won't be any public money. There has to be public money in the world. So those are the pros. What about the cons? Well, the big one, there's kind of two big ones that people talk about mostly. One is disintermediation of the banking system. Right? Banks intermediate. They bring borrowers and savers together. Um, if you have extra money, you put it in a bank account. The bank takes that and makes loans. Right? That's intermediation. Um, they do it in other ways as well. There is the fear that if all of us can have an account at the Fed, why wouldn't we just move our money there? Sure, you know, Bank of America is safe, but it's not as safe as the Fed. Um, and if, if we created a CBDC in such a way that a lot of us moved money to it, to the, to the Fed, um, that would suck a lot of deposits out of the system, which are important uh, means of funding banks, and banks wouldn't be able to make as many loans. So credit creation would diminish. Again, keep in mind, most money in the system is privately created. We'd inflate the Fed balance sheet, but then what's the Fed going to do? How, it, how is it going to invest all that money? Um, and that could also increase the risk of, of, uh, of bank runs, right? If you, if you have the ability to move your money out of a private bank, and suddenly there's maybe a little concern that, you know, Citibank's quarter wasn't too good and I don't know, maybe it's even in trouble. Well, I'll move my money out now. Well, that's just going to increase the likelihood of a run. So particularly in times of stress, it could, it could kind of have what we would call pro-cyclical effects and increase the likelihood of financial instability. Um, big privacy implications as well, right? If we have a digital currency and, well, gee, doesn't that mean the Fed can track every transaction you make? Um, and what, you know, how are we going to prevent that? Or could the Fed even block people from spending money in certain ways? So big privacy concerns. Uh, changes the role of the Fed. People argue that one both ways. Um, you know, it'd be good. It'd be central banking for all. Other people say, well, you know, compromises the independence of the Fed. That's really not what we want the Fed to be doing. We want it to be focused on monetary policy, not providing retail services. Um, there's some operational risk issues too. This would be a you know complex system. What if it goes down? Then we can't you know we're all dependent on that rather than 
a lot of different banks? Is that a problem? And finally, the monetary policy stuff, the arguments kind of cut both ways. Um, yes, we could use it for pumping money into the economy, but should it pay interest? Right? If we all have accounts, would the Fed pay us interest? Now, if we're in a period where interest rates are rising, as we are, and um, banks have accounts at the Fed, and they're going to start, you know, they're getting interest. And then we all, we all have an account at the Fed and we're not getting interest. Well, that seems a little unfair. On the other hand, if the Fed's going to pay you interest, boy, then what reason do you have to put your money in a private bank or even a money market fund if the Fed's being competitive with those? So paying interest could um, um, worsen the disintermediation risk. So it's complicated, lots of complicated issues. Uh, lots of design choices. I won't spend any time on those today, um, but there's lots of different design choices. Sometimes people kind of simple, oversimplify that, but it's actually fairly complicated. Um, so the Fed did a report on this. It was kind of something that many of us anticipated for months because we knew they were working on it. Um, probably got held up because you know it was unclear who was going to get renominated, whether Jay Powell was going to get renominated as Fed chair. Uh, but it finally came out in January. We all kind of uh, quickly looked at it. Uh, but of course, it didn't take a position. And, you know, it was pretty clear ahead of time it wasn't going to take a position. It was just going to sort of lay out the pros and cons. Um, it was, it did signal two important things that they don't really like the retail version. They don't really want to do retail accounts at the Fed. They didn't say it in explicit terms, but reading between the lines, you could, you could pick that up. But they also focused on the, on the privacy concern. They said, you know, look, uh, they spent some time talking about that. So I think the way we should view it is it really kicks off a debate. Um, and there was a second report called the Project Hamilton Report, which was a, a collaboration between the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston and MIT, which was to design a hypothetical platform for a CBDC. That came out a couple of weeks later. Very interesting report because they really, you know, uh, designed a system and uh, they came up with a couple of different designs. It's all very technical, but basically they came up with a, evidence that showed well, that they could build something very fast. In fact, they published the code. The code is available for people to inspect and uh, the speed, transactions per second, was very, very fast, much faster than Bitcoin. Bitcoin is actually very slow. Um, so, you know, Bitcoin is five to seven transactions per second. Uh, Visa is 20,000 to 65,000. The Fed project was, um, you know, up to 1.7 million and it could even be scaled up beyond that. Um, they publish a code and basically the, the, the takeaway from that report is we need to keep doing this. We need to do more research. Uh, so we'll have a debate now, but, you know, Fed governors are, have different views. Members of Congress have different views. There's some who have introduced legislation to prohibit retail accounts at the Fed, some to mandate retail accounts at the Fed. So, um, uh, it's going to take some time. The, the executive order today called for more research and development. And, um, I think that's the right approach, um, because, you know, a lot of central banks around the world are looking at this. In particular, China has developed one, which it is rolling out. It's called the ECNY. Um, that's just a picture of the app on your phone. Lots of reasons, uh, or people speculate on lots of reasons why they're doing this, uh, ranging from uh, they don't like what they're seeing develop in terms of Bitcoin and stablecoin, so they want to make sure there's a digital public money to um, efficiency, even though they already have a very good mobile payment system. Some people think it's actually to assert more control over that private mobile payment system. Uh, the darker visions of this are more about, you know, their, their social control um, uh, mechanism. They're, they're gonna gather vast amounts of information about people. Uh, and they can use that to, you know, monitor people. They can use it to discipline party members um, and so forth. Now, um, 
you will read statements that, you know, we'll talk about they have various levels of anonymity in the transactions. They don't intend to do that, but, you know, un unclear. Um, international reasons, they've, they've said it's not really for international reasons, but I think, you know, it's, it's clearly relevant long-term in that respect because they want to make the yuan uh, more of an international currency. They've got to do a lot of things to make that happen, but this would obviously be one piece of the puzzle. Um, and in particular, they've never liked the way we've used the fact that the international payment systems are heavily dominated by the dollar. We have used those to impose financial sanctions. These quotes were well before Ukraine. <laughs> so you can only imagine what's being said right now about our use of SWIFT and other things um, uh, to impose financial sanctions. Um, most central banks, as I said, have projects in this space. Um, so, you know, a lot of people look at all this and say, well, is the global dominance of the dollar threatened? And I, I you know, I would say a couple things about that. Um, the global dominance of the dollar, meaning its, its dominance in international payments, as well as its status as a reserve currency, is based on lots and lots of things separate from technology. It's the strength of our economy, the strength of our government and the rule of law. It's the size and liquidity of the treasury market. And that's why people, you know, run to treasuries in, in a crisis. But, you know, I don't think we can take uh, that role for granted. And technology will have some role there, but it will take a while. Um, so I think we do need to be, um, uh, we do need to keep those issues in mind. Um, so what should we do? What will we do? I think we will move forward with more aggressive research and development. The White House executive order this morning did call for that. That's good. We should be doing a lot more. I mean, even though we had Project Hamilton, it's small compared to what we should be doing. Uh, we're not spending, I think, we're not making nearly a, a big enough commitment because you can't decide whether to even have a CBDC until you know what it would look like and how you would resolve some of the policy issues I just talked about. And you can't figure that out unless you actually try to build it. Um, and these other things, you know, there are other ways to modernize payments and we should just look at those too. And they're, you know, the Fed is working on that through a project called FedNow, but you know, a lot of people are skeptical it will have as broad a benefits as it should. The financial inclusion issue I talked about before, I think we need to tackle separately. And I'm actually with Hal Jackson coming out with a paper on that tomorrow at Brookings. Um, uh, and we need, to be, we need to be doing this to be at the table internationally. A lot, there is a lot of talk now among different countries about how to make their systems interoperable. But well, we need to be part of that. So that's CBDCs. Um, I'm gonna go on to stable coins unless anyone has any questions about CBDCs. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to make sure I fully understand your argument. So when you talk about improving access and financial inclusion, yeah. you're talking about efforts outside of CBDCs. Well, I'm, yes, that. I'm here. Yes, I'm saying, you know, don't wait for a CBDC. Mm -hmm. Tackle this problem today. There are other ways to tackle it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, can you just speak um, briefly about the design choice as the slide that you uh, just like uh, talked about briefly? On the design? The design, yeah, the design <laughs> options. Well, um, let me try to get through everything else and then we'll come back to that if we have time, okay? Because because that gets kind of in the weeds a little bit and I want to try to make sure I cover everything else. All right, so let's talk about stable coins. So stable coins, what is a stable coin, first of all? It's a digital token, a cryptocurrency whose value is tied to an external asset, right? Bitcoin isn't tied to anything. Its value just depends on what everybody wants to pay for it. Um, a stable coin uh, is tied to a sovereign currency like the dollar or the euro. It could be tied to gold. And there's different ways to maintain that value. Um, is it money? Well, I think the bottom line is probably could be. Um, it's not widely enough, they aren't widely enough used today, but, you know, 
to, in my mind, they could satisfy all these properties if we had a regulatory framework that gave people confidence in their value and in their transparency and so forth. Um, they have dramatically increased in volume over the last two years. We've gone from um, uh, in uh, you know January of 20, they were 2020, they were maybe 20 billion market cap. And today they're about 170 billion. So why have they grown so much? And these are the big ones. Tether is the biggest followed by USDC, which is issued by a company called Circle. Um, why have they grown so much? Well, the, the most important reason is they allow for instant settlement of a crypto transaction. When you buy stock on the New York Stock Exchange, right, you technically have two days to fund. Now your broker may say, I need your money today, but you know, settlement of stock transactions is, is um, two days. We're, we're gonna lower it to one, but there's still time. When you buy crypto, it, it settles instantly. But if you're wiring money and that wire transfer takes a day, then you're not gonna get you know, your crypto instantly. You're not gonna get the price that you thought you were gonna get. If you've already put your money into a stable coin and you have that stable coin sitting at Coinbase or Kraken or wherever you're doing it or in your own uh, hard wallet, then you can in fact buy your crypto and it settles instantly. That's very important in the crypto world. And um, that, so you avoided all these traditional delays. Plus, given that there are thousands of tokens and many crypto exchanges, and there are often differences in the price of the same of Bitcoin or some other coin on different exchanges, there may be small differences, but if you're a big trader, those can matter. Having your money in a stable coin rather than in a fiat currency allows you to quickly arbitrage and move money, move value around. Stable coins have powered the growth of DeFi, of decentralized finance. You can't use your credit card, right? On a, on a decentralized platform. It's just autonomous software. It's only gonna take something that's digital. And that's why we've seen this huge growth in DeFi platforms because it's kind of come with this uh, people recognizing that stable coins would, would provide that. Now, there's also probably some bad reasons. Tax avoidance, any crypto transaction, any buy and sell of, a crypt of crypto is a taxable transaction in this country. Not everybody reports them. And if you sell your crypto for Tether, then that's not going through a bank where that's going to be producing, you know, a 1098. Um, whereas if you sell it for cash and that goes into your bank, your bank might pick that up, especially if it's a large amount. Um, and there might be regulatory avoidance too. If you're in a country with uh, capital controls or something like that, it's easier just to keep your money parked in, in uh, Tether. Again, for people who are trading a lot in the crypto universe. Um, Stablecoins first kind of got attention when, when Facebook made its Libra proposal, which later was called DM, very interesting proposal, but it didn't get off the ground. It's now cratered, but it did make people start to wake up to what these could do. And it's actually what propelled a lot of central banks to start looking at uh, central bank digital currencies. But there are risks. Um, and the basic one is, you know, it's supposed to be a token where if I buy it for a dollar, it's going to be worth it, uh, worth a dollar whenever I redeem it. Well, that depends on what that stablecoin issuer does with my money. If they hold it as cash, maybe even park it in a bank or hold it in treasuries, yeah, then it's going to be worth, you know, the same thing. If they invest it in some something speculative, uh, maybe not. What if they invest it in Bitcoin because they want to make a lot of money? And they think the price of Bitcoin is going to go up. There is no federal regulation of those investments. There's no federal regulatory regime on stablecoin issuers. There is only effectively today state regulation, which is pretty light. There's no transparency about all that. There's no audit requirements generally. One or there's been a couple of 
uh, some stablecoin issuers have done that voluntarily, or Tether has had to do it because of an action brought by uh, the New York Attorney General. So this poses a lot of risks. You could have runs as you do, as we have had with money market funds. They're very similar in, in that respect to money market funds. Um, and you know, maybe a run on one stable coin would trigger runs on all stable coins or more stable coins. There are other risks. Um, they could be used for illicit finance. Uh, again, money laundering. I talked about kind of uh, legal avoidance. Um, there's operational risk because stable coins might be issued by Tether, let's say, or, or, or Circle, but then they trade on these decentralized blockchains. And Tether, for example, and and a USDC trade on multiple blockchains. Well, what's the resiliency of those blockchains? You know, might they have problems? Um, no oversight really there. Um, so there was a report by something called the President's Working Group on Financial Markets. This came out in November. And uh, it was good because some of us, including me, had been pushing Treasury to really look at this. And a uh, 22 page report on the risks, one sentence on the benefits. Didn't quite think they got that balance right, but you know. Um, and they highlighted the main risks I've just talked about. The run risk, the uh, payment system risks, which has to do with the fact that they do trade on these decentralized uh, blockchains. And also they, they were very focused on the risk of scale and concentration of power, meaning that, gee, there could be one stable coin issuer because of network effects that becomes very, very big. And then, you know, it has a lot of data on transactions and people. And obviously the, the, the fact that Facebook had come out with a proposal weighed on their minds. Um, and they cited the kind of traditional separation we have between commerce and banking. We don't want commercial firms having running banks or providing those services. So they made some recommendations. Um, the main one was we should limit stablecoin issuers to insured depository institutions. Then they have to be subject to traditional kind of consolidated supervision, the full panoply of bank regulation. Um, um, and maybe we even give them access to the safety net, meaning deposit insurance. Um, we should also regulate those other arrangements and we should limit commercial affiliation. So I thought, this was, and, and we need new legislation to do this because regulators don't have the power today to, to, to do this. I thought this was um, overly conservative. I think, frankly, if we were to implement those recommendations, it would be a big win for the big banks because they would be the only ones who would be able to issue uh, stable coins, or at least they would be the ones who'd be able to issue them first. Why is that? First reason is it takes um, time for someone to be chartered as uh, and, and get FDIC insurance. Uh, so, you know, you could be talking about a couple of years uh, before you get that. Um, and even among banks, it's going to be the biggest banks that have the technology platforms to do this. You've got to, again, settle in real time. You know, smaller banks aren't going to be able to do that. Um, and I don't even, you know, I don't think you need deposit insurance. Uh, if, you're, if you require a stablecoin issuer to keep all the reserves in high quality assets. Um, so, you know, I was advocating and I, uh, for, you know, a model that said, sure, let banks issue them, but we should also kind of have a, a narrow bank concept where other issuers could, could uh, issue them. I think bank, a bank-like regulation is better than money market fund regulation. Some people have argued these aren't these money market funds. And the reason I say that is they really are payment mechanisms. They're not really investments. It gets complicated if you talk, start talking about stable coins that pay interest, but that's a different story. Um, but fortunately, um, the undersecretary at the treasury, Nellie Liang, has started to kind of modify uh, their view and signaled some flexibility that maybe there could be kind of a narrow bank uh, approach as well. Um, but, you know, they very much want a federal scheme here. Um, different views in Congress uh, on this, but growing interest. And I think, you know, we easily could see something happen on stable coins well before we see 
anything happen on CBDCs or even on crypto regulation generally, because people kind of get it. They, they, they kind of understand that, oh, okay, this is, this is kind of a, you know, a digital uh, deposit or something, this, this, and it's a payment mechanism. So we could see something happen there. Um, and I think foreign developments, if we see more foreign development of stable coins, that could also spur us uh, forward. Um, so uh, it may, <laughs> It may actually go faster too if the Republicans take over Congress because some of the Democrats who chair the key committees don't like stable coins, but we'll see. Um, okay, so that's stable coins. Let me pause for a minute. Yeah, sure. Uh, the first one was on your slide about stable coins making cross-border payments easier yeah. and faster. So I've actually used a stable coin, it's USDT, if I'm yeah. not mistaken, yeah. to uh, process cross-border payments to my own country yeah. and to my crypto wallet in that country from yeah. my crypto wallet here. I use Coinbase here. And it, the purchase is actually very easy. So I just transferred from my bank account here in the US to my crypto wallet in the US. But yeah. when I tried to transfer the USDT from the crypto wallet here to the crypto wallet in another country, uh, so they had like a 16 day buffer period. Really? So, yeah. So I Circled had to wait 16 it. days for the money to be able to be transferred to my crypto wallet in another country. But if I want to trade my stable coins for another cryptocurrency or crypto asset, I can do it instantly. Oh, that's very interesting. Yeah, so that's one point. And the second point is that I want to ask you, will Section 13.3 apply to stablecoin issuers at its current form? How do you mean? In let's what say, sense? Uh, let's you mean say if they that, got in trouble? Yeah, they got in trouble. Okay, so Section 13.3 is a provision of the Federal Reserve Act under which the Fed can make um, loans, basically, to deal with um, not just banks, but even non-banks. That it's the provision the Fed has used in financial crises to lend, to provide liquidity uh, to many different areas. Um, you know, um, 13.3 was revised, as you may know, in Dodd-Frank, so it has, a, has to be a program of broad applicability. But yes, they conceivably could. They don't want to. I think today they, you know, they'd rather see it all regulated. But in theory, they could, I think. Yeah. Hi, Tim. Um, I was watching a video by um, uh, Gary Gensner, uh, SEC yeah. chair, and yeah. a few, I think it was uh, late last year, he was saying that today's stablecoin is like a big game casino, online casino, and he calls for tight regulations on this. Yeah. And as a uh, SEC chair and, and and your position on, on the CFTC yeah. uh, and the Fed, and who, who should be the regulated body of, of this, this, uh, this yeah. category? Yeah. So um, for stable coins, I think I think we should create a specific model that uh, does that isn't the SEC that is in fact bank a bank like regulator for stable coins for the rest of crypto. I'm going to get to that in a moment. Um, so thinking about applying regulation to these stable coins, yeah. I'd assume that a narrow bank regulation would still involve you know some pretty heavy audit requirements, yes, some pretty absolutely. strict limitations on the yes. types of assets the stable coin. Um, right. I guess could invest in. What's your feeling for how commercially viable such a narrow bank yeah, would actually be? Yeah, good question. Um, I think they're very commercially viable. Um, and certainly the people trying to do them think that as well. Um, and, you know, a simple kind of model where that's all you do. Look, particularly if interest rates go up and you're not paying interest, I mean, you're going to make money hand over fist, you know, because <laughs> you're really talking about a bank that doesn't take credit risk right? A bank that only has payment risk. It's only doing payments. And, um, you know, it's not paying out any interest, but it's holding all this money. And even if it's just invested in treasuries, you're going to earn a little bit of a margin. So, yeah. So I'm going to exercise the prerogative yeah, sure. of, uh, the moderator to some extent. So we were on a, uh, Tim and I were on a call last Friday where the Hoover Institution unveiled kind of whole report on digital currencies and whatever. Yeah. And one of the speakers was, uh, I think he was the former CEO. Stuart, yeah. Uh -huh. uh, Stuart Levy. Yeah, yep. Hubert Levy of, of Diem. Mm -hmm. And basically his comment was, we did our job and we thought yep. it was viable and yep. you, the regulators, didn't do your job 
And if you had, we'd still be around, but we just, right. we just right. basically got so annoyed that you couldn't give us clarity that we just decided not to pursue it for now. Right. And if you think about the question of stable coins as a, you know, your definition of money, mm -hmm. and you think about it as private money, and you, you, you kind of raise the question relative to what? And I could see something like Diem being an effective private currency that actually is more stable and is backed by a set of assets, basically Facebook or Meta's assets, that in some countries it would be a more Absolutely. St stable asset, which is why I would understand why they would want to do that. Yep. But what's the, how to, to, to Justice's point, how do you kind of tie that into a regulatory structure and how quickly or sure. is it possible? Well, again, I mean, I think where Treasury is coming out is we need new legislation. I think you could have, you could argue that the office of the controller of the currency could do it today. And that's what, where Diem was. I mean, Diem's problem, look, I came out, I basically wrote a paper shortly after Diem came out saying, yeah, I understand all the objections to Facebook and the fact that they, you know, may have screwed up in the election and did this and that, but this is an important concept and we should create a regulatory framework where these things can go forward. Um, that didn't happen. Um, and I think, you know, this was the one case where Facebook asked for permission. Uh, what happened was they made the proposal, everybody disliked it. And the original proposal was kind of flawed in that it was, it was a basket of currencies. It was one token that represented a basket and central bankers just couldn't deal with that. And rightly so. Um, so you had, you know, Jay Powell not liking it, President Trump not liking it, Maxine Waters, the very liberal chair of the House Financial Services Committee, not liking it. I've never seen that happen on, I think, any issue. And, and so they went before they had hearings on it. And um, it wasn't Stewart then, it was a guy named David Marcus, but also Mark Zuckerberg testified. And over and over, they said, look, we won't launch until we get all regulatory approvals. They were asked that question repeatedly. Are you going to get all regulatory approvals before you launch this thing? I said, oh, yes, 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 we will. Now, the problem was, I remember sitting there watching this, it's like, well, what are the regulatory approvals? You know, we haven't set up the structure. So Stuart, you know, I would talk to Stuart occasionally. They couldn't ever get the Fed. And, you know, the Fed, as Stuart said, the Fed basically says, well, we like yours better than any other we see out there, but, you know, we just can't sign off on this. Now, the other ironic thing about all this, all these people in Congress, you know, again, I think a lot of it was motivated by antipathy toward Facebook, but they were also kind of saying, well, this is going to undermine the U.S. dollar. This is going to hurt the U.S. dollar. Well, I was in China shortly after they announced the Libra originally, and everyone I talked to in China, all the government officials were like worried about Libra because they thought it would promote the dollar. <laughs> they thought it would be, you know, the dollar would dominate the basket. And, and this was going to be a backdoor dollarization. And Libra actually caused them to accelerate their development of their CBDC. So they got it. We didn't in my book. Right? You agree, Khan? <laughs> um, is there a way in which U.S. dollar stable coins can still be used by the U.S. to enforce sanction policies. I think they could. I so. think they could. I mean, and, and DM was ready to say they would. I was very surprised when DM changed its tune on this because I said, wow, that's interesting. Uh, but they said, yeah, we'll comply. So, I mean, I think that's another reason to go forward is to create these. And the flip side, I, I've talked about the flip side too, right? Which is in theory, what's to prevent another country that's sitting on a lot of treasuries or other cash from having one of its banks create its own dollar stable coin. Dollar backed stable coin. Yes, that is detached from our banking system and our sanctions regime. And so then, you know, you don't have to get oil reserves now sold in yuan. You say, you can denominate them in dollars, just pay through our system. Tim, just uh, to follow up on the uh, the question. Um, so you mentioned that the report says uh, more research into yes. this category. 
but China is already accelerated pretty fast. You look at what Winter Olympics they have yes. demoed. Yes, you know transaction. Right. I, I've watched the demo live, and yeah. I've I've watched people using it, and they are testing. Um, a scale is three hundred thousand, a uh, three hundred million people. Yeah, and which is the the population of the United States. Right, and I could see them try to broaden their influence through Bell Road initiatives, and all their neighboring countries might might finance through this uh, ERMB thing. Yep. And um, do you think U.S. should do uh, re, uh say less? Talk less, but do more. I think I feel that's the, really the issue here. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, I mean, that's why I say, look, we got to do more research and development. There's plenty of people like me who can sit around and talk about, should we have one? Should we not have one? What's the policy? That's like worth nothing, right? I mean, that and 250 will get you on the metro or whatever the price is here. We've got to do more research and development and figure out what this would look like. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this might be a technical question, but just... In the scenario where you regulate stable coins, and yeah. let's say you have Wells Fargo issues a stable coin, right? In that scenario, would it be like one to one backed? Yeah. yeah. And it and if that is so, then it doesn't really seem to me as a very attractive sort of business model because today, bank. with a dollar, they can lend say Good call question. it ten dollars. So, so this, yeah. yeah, excellent question. So, I guess I would say, look, I think to start in this space, the one to one backing is a good approach because it's conservative. But you're right, what's the bank's incentive to do that if they can't leverage the deposits? Now, some people would say, well, let them leverage it. You know, Let them leverage it the way they do other deposits. So what if it's instant settlement? Why should that make a difference? Um, you know, There's good theoretical arguments for that. I just feel, God, it's all so new. We haven't even gotten there yet. Let's take it one step at a time. It's kind of like, I don't know if you remember, but you know, when we first let savings and loans pay interest on checking and we first let money market funds have, you know, you could write a check, but you could only write four checks a month or something. You know, we we kind of inched our way into it. I, I kind of feel like we may have to do that with stable coins. I mean, okay. one, of, one of the things, I know you've got more to go through, so I'm trying not to hold too <laughs> much, but um, one of the things that came up, I was, had a discussion the other day with Karen Mills, who had been the head of the Small Business Administration. Yeah. And, and Karen and I were talking about, there's a there's a, some papers out like uh, from a woman at NYU that shows that um, fintechs in their loan processes yes. have less um, bias. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Uh, right. Than community banks or other right. banks. Uh -huh. And part of me is like, why aren't we accelerating um, part of it, part of it is, I, I don't know if I can get it much closer. I'm practically <laughs> swallowing it. But, um, so, so, um, but, the, but the fintechs, why not? So what if you disintermediate banks to some extent? And so what, I mean, the consumer benefits. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, um, the disintermediation thing is a little tricky. Um, it, I mean, it's a, an important issue. And I've talked with a lot of people about this. I mean, there's one view that, like, well, just make the banks compete a little bit more. It's just a pricing issue, you know, and we'll, you know, there'll still be banks in the picture, but we'll have these other things as well. Um, so, well, I mean, they're I not, to the discussion, they're not necessarily incented, you know. They're not in, incented today to, to innovate today. To innovate. And, right, and, that's the problem. And so how do yeah. you kind of change no, that No, I mean, I think dynamic. that's one of the main arguments for stable coins is it's competition. It, it incentivizes um, innovation. Right. In the and then uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> On the China side of it question, you know, China is expanding dramatically the, the ECNY right. in China itself. Um, but there is an, in, an implied aspect of that, which is um, they're starting to set their first mover advantages to them of setting standards for cross-border payments. Yes, absolutely. And they're starting to absolutely. define the technological standards yep. and the principles absolutely. by which those occur. And that does seem like it would be in some ways a threat to the res dollar as a reserve currency yeah. and the structure. No, that's, I mean, that's why we need to be at the table. We need to be further along in the R&D so that we can at least be at the table. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. So um, I may go over a little bit. If you have to leave, just leave. Can I just continue? Is that okay? Okay. 
So, um, so we're going to talk about Bitcoin and altcoins and just kind of general regulation of those. This is a chart of the largest. Of course, Bitcoin is the largest by far. Then Ethereum, um, Tether is in there. Um, so yeah, you're all probably familiar with this. I mean, the price, you know, was above sixty thousand last fall. More mainstream institutions entering. You can easily purchase it in lots of different ways. We now have Bitcoin futures ETFs, but of course the flip side is it's not a payment system, right? I mean, it's a speculative investment and it's not a payment system for a lot of reasons. Um, the price is volatile. Um, there's very low uh, transactions per second, but also it's a tax event. Every, you know, when you use it, there's a tax event there. You're supposed to pay taxes every time. And of course now the IRS has even put a question on the form 1040. Have you sold or exchanged cryptocurrencies this year? You got to check yes or no. Um, and of course, there's the energy and efficiency problem. Um, so, you know, I don't think it meets the test of money. The other thing, some of the other things that are quite interesting about Bitcoin, though, I think a lot of people overlook or don't know, is it's highly concentrated in terms of both ownership of Bitcoin and the mining uh, capacity. There was a recent MIT paper that concluded based on really extensive analysis that 50 miners control 50% of the mining capacity. And if you're familiar with Bitcoin, you know how the blockchain works. You know that the blockchain is immutable unless of course 51% of miners decide it needs to be changed. Well, if you've already got 50, you know, controlling 50, uh, it's not hard to imagine collusion there. So that's a risk. Um, but of course the technology is important. The, the existing regulatory framework in the US is very fragmented um, among a number of different agencies that each have a little piece of it. And I'll, I'll go through this. Uh, a lot of people don't fully get this. What they've heard is that a, a cryptocurrency is either a security or a commodity. So people have this thought that, well, does that, doesn't that just mean that the SEC and the CFTC have to kind of decide which is which, and then you know that'll address it. But it's not that simple. Um, the problem is the SEC only has jurisdiction if a cryptocurrency is a security. And there is an old test for that. Um, it goes back to a 1945 Supreme Court case involving orange groves in Florida called the Howey case. And of course, the fact that it's you know decades old and about orange groves and real estate in Florida makes you know crypto advocates just enraged that their entire industry is now being judged by uh, principles that come out of it. But um, the Howey test had four elements. Something is a security if it involves an investment of money in a common enterprise where there's an expectation of profits in the, from the managerial efforts of others. Now that's okay, a complicated test, but you can apply it. When you apply that test, test Bitcoin is not a security, but there's not like a list right? We got to wait for the SEC to kind of bring an action to say something is a security. Um, so the point is that that's all they can regulate. And so what about cryptocurrencies that aren't securities? Well, when I was at the CFTC, we did say that cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin were commodities, but that was only because people wanted to start to do futures and swaps based on Bitcoin and anything used in a future contract, futures contract or a swap contract can be declared a commodity. But that did not give, a, and that gave us jurisdiction over those futures contracts and swap contracts, but it didn't give us plenary jurisdiction over the cash market, which is where most people trade, right? You go out and maybe some, some of you have bought Bitcoin futures, but most people just buy Bitcoin. So we, the CFTC has very limited jurisdiction there. Can't set standards for Coinbase. So there is a gap. I, I love to use the London um, symbol for this. There's nobody, no federal regulator has plenary jurisdiction over the cash market for cryptocurrencies that aren't securities, which is where most of the trading is. The other way I sort of explain this is kind of fun. That's a logo of the National Beef Company, which, you know, raised cattle, sold beef, used to be a public company. So if you bought its securities, that was regulated by the SEC. If on the other hand, you went to the CME, this is a screen from the CME in the lower right corner, live cattle futures. If you bought a cattle future, that's regulated 
by the CFTC. But if you want to buy a cow, nobody's regulating that. And that's essentially what we're talking about with Bitcoin. Uh, so, and the, the ironic thing about all this is that, you know, when Bitcoin was launched, the idea in the white paper of um, Satoshi Nakamoto and others picked up on this was we were going to not have to rely on large intermediaries, going to create peer-to-peer -peer payments, right? And those were the intermediaries that brought down the financial system anyway, the big banks. In fact, part of what's happened is it's created this whole new set of intermediaries like Coinbase, like Kraken, like Binance, like FTX, that effectively aren't regulated at the federal level. Um, and there's a list of the exchanges. I won't spend any time on that, but um, they lack, we lack the federal oversight that we have for securities exchanges and, and derivatives exchanges. We just don't have all those standards. Now, I'm not saying they're terrible on all these scores and some are better than others. And I think, you know, some of them are trying to improve their standards, but they're just doing that voluntarily to kind of whatever the market they feel requires. And, um, you know, there's no obligation to. So, you know, as an example, uh, Coinbase um, can have its own proprietary trading operation, right? So you go, want, you want to buy something on, on uh, Coinbase, but Coinbase could be trading uh, alongside. And could they front run your trade? Hmm, possible in theory. Coinbase has interests, financial interests in some of the crypto tokens they've listed. So the NYSE could never do either of those things, right? So that's kind of the nature of the problem. Um, and so, you know, both the SEC and the CFTC are trying to use their authority to the extent they can, but they can't really fill this gap. Um, I'm going to skip this, but, and there's broader risks um, from all this. One is the use of crypto for illicit activity. We've seen that grow in terms of ransomware. And, you know, if you don't have a good, if you don't have a framework that requires crypto exchanges to report, um, they can even, um, they don't even, they're not even required, for example, to prohibit what's called wash trading, which is where somebody essentially trades with themselves to inflate the price, but they can also do that to kind of try to hide their path, you know, just do it through a number of different accounts. Um, you know, it makes it harder to prevent illicit activity um, if, you, if you're not regulating that. And conceivably, there could be financial stability risks. I mean, I think the sector is still small enough that I don't think that's a problem, but we don't really have enough insight in a lot of them. So I think we do uh, need to address that. Now, the one area where there is federal oversight um, of at least the, the, the exchanges is in the KYC AML area, anti-money laundering, because the exchanges have to register at the state level and that makes them money transmitters. And as a money transmitter, they can be subject to the Bank Secrecy Act. So that's good. And I think FinCEN, which is an arm of the treasury that enforces the Bank Secrecy Act has done a good job. But again, if you don't have kind of general oversight, if you don't have transparency, if you don't have reporting, it makes it harder to, for them to do their job. Um, so we need to close the gap. You could do that by expanding the jurisdiction of the SEC or the CFTC. There's actually some moves to try to, do, to expand the jurisdiction of the CFTC right now. I don't know whether they'll, they'll go through. I think this issue is still one around which there's not enough of a consensus in Congress. There's still people in Congress who would rather just, you know, um, exempt a lot of the activity from regulation. Um, and I, my view has never been to, you know, prohibit people from trading in any way. My view has always been, let people buy and sell what they want. I'm, the, I'm not smart enough to tell them, you know, is this a good investment? But that's got to be, you know, our, our financial markets are strongest if we have that transparency, if we have that integrity, if we have that framework of basic standards, as we've done with securities and derivatives. So. You know, I personally am skeptical of the of the use case in some ways of Bitcoin. I think blockchain technology, though, is really important. And had we not had Bitcoin, 
that would, you know, we wouldn't have seen the development of stable coins. We wouldn't have seen the development of central bank digital currencies. So who's to say where this goes? But, you know, I think we need that regulatory framework. Um, quick note on the Ukraine war. Um, I think it could increase the urgency of regulation because of all, there's been a lot of talk lately about whether uh, crypto could be used to escape sanctions. I don't think the Russian government could do that because the scale of what they need to do relative to the scale of the crypto market is just, the crypto market isn't big enough. Plus they'd still have to go through a lot of banks that are gonna be subject to the sanctions. But you know, maybe some oligarchs could escape some of the pain of the sanctions this way. Um, and I also think that, you know, because we are using SWIFT and because we are enforcing these sanctions, just as every time we've done sanctions, um, that kind of just spurs further to the development of alternative systems. I mean, not just CBDCs, but, the, you know, the Chinese have had uh, the SIP system, um, um, which uh, is kind of an alternative to SWIFT. It's very small compared to SWIFT. The Russians have one too. Those are very small, but I'm sure this whole event is making them, you know, look at ways to um, to expand those. Um, and that in turn could, you know, encourage us to move faster on stable coins and CBDCs. So we'll see. So let me stop there. Um, take any other questions. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Just one question on the effect of the Ukraine war yeah. on uh, grand crypto, like for example, on Bitcoin. Like yeah. when you want to make an account on the exchange, they do the KYC, right? And if you want to add funds to it, you have to add funds from your bank account. Let's say a Russian oligarch wants to launder his or her money or their money using right. crypto. Right. Will their bank account be blocked first before they can exchange their money the, into crypto? Yeah, so the crypto exchanges should be enforcing the sanctions, meaning if, if somebody's on that list, they should be freezing that account. The banks certainly are. And I, you know, I think the crypto exchanges are too. I mean, what the crypto exchanges said which I understand was, look, we're not going to freeze the account of every single person in Russia. You know, that would be a bit much, um, but they should be freezing the accounts of anyone on the list. Any other I mean, questions? there would be, yeah. in Cyprus, for example, um, basically took the banks and the oligarchs out of the SWIFT system, uh, but I don't know if that's going to be sufficient uh, to, your, to the question, but yeah. Um, if there are no other questions, then yeah. maybe we can go back to uh, that. Sure. <laughs> so, um, yeah, yeah. So on the design. So, you know, again, the, the kind of typical outline you see is, is it retail or wholesale? Wholesale meaning the CBDC is really just initially some, the, the Fed CBDC, if you will, the Fed liability only goes to the banks. And then the banks effectively do some kind of wrapper around that to issue it to customers. And that would be a way of, of avoiding disintermediation. Um, but, you know, the fear is, yeah, but do the banks have enough incentive then to really pass it on? Now, if you said, well, we're not just gonna have the Fed provide the CBDC to banks, but we're gonna have them provide it to alternative payment companies, then it might. You know, so, and people refer to those as intermediated systems. Sometimes they're kind of hybrid systems because they still have some retail element. There's another type of approach, which is it is a liability. We still get a liability of the Fed, but the banks are kind of providing a custody function. So they're, they're kind of, your, your account is with the bank. But it is, but you do own something that's a liability of the Fed. And I, I, I guess I would describe the Chinese system as pretty close to that, right? Would you agree, Tom? Um, um, then there's issues about whether it's kind of a token or account based, right? And account meaning we kind of track it in terms of whose account it is versus we track the token itself. And that's kind of the focus of of monitoring. Um, but 
you know, there's lots of variations on this. And if you want to read, take a look at the Project Hamilton paper because they talk about this a fair amount. Yeah. Um, I want to ask about the privacy issue. Yeah. And, and it seems that it's not an issue for Chinese government because they already, yeah. you know, they can do whatever they want overnight, right? And just completely over, yeah. overhaul the entire monetary system yeah. if they want to. But in the US, could that be the biggest uh, hindrance or the block for yeah. something like CBDC I, to move forward? Yeah, I, I think it'll be one of the, I think there'll be the two big issues in my mind are disintermediation and privacy. I think both are, are gonna be big. And, um, you know, on the privacy side, you know, I think Project Hamilton will look at that more and more. They talked a little bit about that. And again, that paper and even the summary for those of us who are less technical, you know, was useful. Um, but they basically talked about, you know, separating kind of the, the effectuation of the transaction from the account information so that, you know, all that account information doesn't necessarily go to the Fed. Um, um, you know, the Chinese um, system, I mean, you can read about it and they will say, well, we have different levels of anonymity. We're not, you know, the CBOC isn't routinely collecting all that information, but, you know, I think they would have access to it. We'll have to come up with something that will persuade people. Not only are they not doing it, but they really couldn't do it without, say, a warrant, without a court process. And that's a challenge. Um, just I mean, back to one to the to the design question. I may not have mentioned this, but one issue on on intermediation on the intermediation risk that goes to the design is: Could you imagine retail accounts of some sort or retail usage that's capped as to the amount? A lot of people have suggested that as a as a way to address this disintermediation risk, and that could conceivably work, except that different banks are gonna react differently to that, right? For JP Morgan, if you said, you know, it's a cap of 1500 per account, they'd say, yeah, okay, fine. I mean, they've written a research paper that said, yeah, that's fine. You talk to community bankers and they're like, that's not fine at all. You know, we got a lot of accounts that are smaller than that. And believe me, every member of Congress has a community banker in his or her district who is gonna talk to that congressman and say, we don't want that. They're very powerful influence. So that's another kind of design. So there was a question oh, online. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can you talk about European CBDC projects? Yeah, either? yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, um, they are pursuing it also. Um, you know, no one has made a commitment to do it. Everybody's studying it. Everybody's got active research and development by everybody. I mean, big nations. Uh, European Central Bank is, uh, the UK is. Uh, the Bank for International Settlements um, is doing a lot of work in terms of interoperability of systems. Um, so there's a lot of work going on, but you know, no one other, no big country other than China has really said, okay, we're doing it. And even Sweden has been looking at this probably longer than anybody, and they haven't, they haven't pulled the trigger on it. Um, one thing I wanted to comment on with regard to China is that. Some people speculate that, for example, the crackdown on Alibaba uh, yeah. and Tencent um, is partially a function of the breadth of information that Alipay, for example, was collecting um, and the concern that the um, PRC had about that information and the lack of control over it. And that part of what they're doing is bringing that basically in-house. And if you look at the, like there's a research institute that is, working of the PBOC, working between the PBOC and Huawei and trying to build a new IP infrastructure that allows uh, it right now, an application layer is distinct from all the lower layers in a computing kind of model. And you can, so, the, so you can't see into what's the content and who's sending it and who's receiving it. But under the new infrastructure that Huawei is working on, on behalf, I think, of the PRC, is they will be able to see into that. And so when we listened to this, uh, we were on this call last Friday, there was a lot of concern that China would be able to look into personal transactions, 
have them identified to yep. individuals, see the content of the transaction, uh, financial transaction, and you know if they get those standards implemented on a global basis, that creates a, a risk that that's not true just in China, but it's true for me and you and Tim and everybody else. Um, and that's, I mean, that's my concern about why part of the concern of like why we need to accelerate. Yeah, I completely agree with you. Right. 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 Okay, last question. Yeah. One more back there. Yeah. So one one frustration I've been hearing is about sort of the the ambiguity coming out of FOMC meetings and monetary policy in general, yeah. where there's differences between announcements and the minutes that come out, for example. Right. At the same time, I think one of the breakthroughs that crypto has brought was visibility on the ultimate supply of a given currency. Are there any CBDC projects that attempt to codify sort of the monetary policy so that we, I mean, it doesn't seem like the, the CBDC idea for the US would still yield a lot of sort of discretion around monetary policy. Are there any projects that would sort of codify it and say the supply is sort of an absolute function of what inflation is or how the economy is doing? Hmm. I guess I would say the, the money supply issues that are debated that I see are really separate from the CBDC debate. The CBDC debate though, um, I mean, clearly an element of it is its implications for monetary policy. I may, I may not quite be understanding the question, but I guess see in all the CBDC stuff, all the reports that are issued, there's always a section on implications for monetary policy, implications for money supply, should it bear interest, should it not bear interest, you know, how do we use it? But I, I guess I'm not quite sure what your question is on sort of limiting the money supply. Oh, 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 I see, I see, yeah, yeah. In other words, what gets some people excited about crypto is it's this, it's this anti-inflation thing. It prevents um, inflation of the money supply. Um, no, I've not seen that because I think the bank, the central bankers of the world, I think generally would regard that attitude on the part of crypto enthusiasts as kind of not very persuasive, right? Not, it's not how we think about money supply generally, right? I mean, we care about inflation. We care about price stability. And, you know, if I ask you, you know, what the inflation rate is today, you might know that. And you might know that, you know, a couple of years ago, it was lower. If I asked you, what was the money supply today? And what was it two years ago? Would you even care? I mean, you care about the inflation. So I think most central bankers kind of dismiss that concern of crypto and, and kind of regard that argument as not, you know, is not being compelling, a compelling use case for crypto. I mean, I do think, is, this is not my area of expertise, but so it's a question, but it doesn't feel to me that different than what used to be the arguments for maintaining the gold standard. Yeah, it is, it is very similar to that. And, you know, we kind of realized in the Great Depression that mm, that wasn't the right way to think. Well, about and, it. and Nixon, actually, of all people, well, in 1971, no. just disconnected gold. Well, he disconnected, he disconnected us from Bretton Woods, but that was only a nominal pe uh, pricing to gold, right? FDR took us off the gold. Took, the, took us off took, the gold standard. Took the convertibility right. off. Right. All right. Um, let's thank Tim for a sure. terrific My session. And thank, thank you for taking the time. Yeah, no, it's fun. Okay. Thank you all.